What is up, weather enthusiasts? I'm your host, Pat's Path Predictor. Let's get right into the weather. All right, so here's the situation we have for you, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we are going to be mainly talking about the threat for the Carolinas, as I've been continuing to monitor the situation over there, at least for this hurricane season. And as the title and thumbnail suggests, I believe that they are in the greatest threat in years for a possible hurricane to happen within the hurricane season. And we'll go get right into it just right about now. We're going to go ahead and jump uh, right into the situation that I have right here. So this is the Carolinas right here. They're in the east coast of the United States. And this year is going to be a bit of an interesting season considering it's going to be a very it's going to be a very active hurricane season as a lot of the forecasts have initiated. I know it seems like it's a pretty quiet season right now because we haven't really had much activity so far and it's early June, and I know a lot of people right now on my Discord server are going, eh, it's not going to be an active hurricane season. It's turning into a bust. First of all, way too early, guys. Way too early, guys. I get it. I know I, you would, if you're looking for an active season, I know you would expect something to happen earlier in the season, but hey, not every hurricane season is the same. And we saw that last year where you're expecting a rather below average to average hurricane season earlier in the season, and then it ramped up, and then things became pretty active. We had 20 named storms in 2023. This was because even though, yes, it was an El Nino year, no, it wasn't even doing very much because the Atlantic SST anomalies, the sea surface temperature anomalies, rather, were so warm and so over the average that they have pretty much canceled out the strength of the El Nino. And considering we are moving into a neutral and a La Nina phase right uh, as of right now, it's definitely something to pay attention. Although, that run region that we are paying attention to, Region 4, has been fighting for its life. Like, the El Nino has been fighting for uh, for dear life in a lot of these areas right here. Uh, right here, seeing a general increase in SSTs right uh, right now in Regions 3 and 4. This is expected to fluctuate and go up and down, up and down. But this El Nino is holding on by a thread. And it's definitely something to pay attention to. And as what we some continue to take a look at. However, it is going to be on a downward trend uh, pretty much at this at, by the end of this month and as we get into july and into early august we start to see that la nina start to kick in right in the time for active uh, hurricane season so you're probably wondering you're talking about all this banter and everything like that patrick but what do you what's the threat for the Nor for the carolinas well here's the situation that we have right here and what we're going to be doing is we're not going to be doing models once again for those of you who are looking for some computer model analysis, we're not going to be doing too much of that. We are going to do some, and that's mainly to cross-check like the moisture anomalies as well as the shear anomalies and everything like that just to check. But we're mainly going to be basing this off of, like we did with our Florida video, more of a geography and uh, meteorological uh, based off of that due to storm surge, winds, everything like that, as well as taking a look at uh, a few areas that I'm paying attention to. So without further ado, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, take a look at essentially what the as those anomalies look like. Let's go ahead and pull up uh, the climate model. We're going to go ahead and pull up the CANSIPS right here, and we're going to be using the monthly anomalies right here just to take a look at them right here. And here's the situation that we have right here. As we typically uh, as we typically see, we're going to be start starting in late August into early September. We're going to start seeing these Cape Verde set uh, setups where we have hurricane a lot of tropical waves start to f uh, develop and then organize and strengthen as it moves uh, off the coast of Africa and then starts and then it starts to intensify and it continues through the Atlantic Basin and then it either curves out to the east or it moves towards uh, the east coast right here. Now, that is going to be dependent on a few factors right there. The biggest factor of which is going to be the main sea level pressure anomaly at this current point in time. So what are we potentially going to be looking at? What's the Bermuda and uh, Bermuda high going to be looking like? What's the Azores high, high going to be looking like? Well... Interestingly enough, here's what we have going on. We are expecting a uh, we are expecting a weaker to moderate La, Ni uh, La Nina uh, setup for this point in, t uh, in time, which I've been told by my tropical team on Storms United that that's actually more favorable for us uh, for a landfalling setup to happen, mainly due to the fact that it's not going to be weakening the Bermuda High as much. Trade winds will be uh, will still be 
uh, will not be as weak and will still have enough of a pressure gradient to kind of keep the Bermuda hide in, in check and kind of over uh, the Atlantic Ocean without it collapsing like it did last year. So that's what we're, uh, we're what we're looking at right here. So this is what we have right here. We have an average Bermuda high uh, pressure around 1023 hectopascals or millibars right here. It's over uh, overall. If you have a stronger hur uh, hurricane, it's going to be enough to push it over to the uh, to the coast. But if you have a weaker setup, any kind of opening that this Bermuda high gives, it'll just move out to sea and stay harmlessly out there. Maybe impact Bermuda uh, for a little bit, but that's about it. But I'm looking at it right now, and I'm looking at it uh, for this season especially. I don't think we're going to see that uh, that much of a situation like that we did anymore, mainly because the steering currents are going to be stronger to push it uh, towards the coast. We talked about the Gulf Coast threat. We talked about Florida, obviously. Now we're talking about the Carolinas. My main timeline for the threat for the Carolinas is I'd say between I'd, I'd say August 20th and October 20th. That's my main timeline for the threat for those of you who are tuning in from North and South Carolina. And the reason I'm saying that is because that's when you see your Cape Verde setup start to organize, develop, and strengthen. And then you'll have those uh, steering currents that will be strong enough to push it into the Carolinas coast if it does happen. So we'll have to pay very close attention to that. Uh, to that, The last time you guys got directly impacted by a hurricane was Isaias in 2020. And the last time you got affected by a tropical cyclone was her tropical storm Ophelia, a.k.a. Hurricane Ophelia, for a couple of hours. For uh, uh, And that made landfall as a 70-mile-per-hour tropical storm. I believe, on the North Carolina-South Carolina border. Correct me if I am wrong. But anyway, here's what the threat I am looking at right here. And we're going to be mainly going through section through section, and we're going to start to the south. We're going to start in South Carolina, and we're going to uh, move uh, pretty much from the uh, Georgia-South Carolina border to around the Charleston region because th there's a lot of low-laying areas right the, uh, right there that do have a huge threat for hurricane uh, hurricane impacts going forward right here even going as far as Catholic Hill if you're in a category 1 hurricane part of the reason is is due to the fact that there's a lot of river basins there's a lot uh, a lot of uh, areas like swamplands everything like that there's also a lot of crops that are being grown here in low lying areas that we need to pay attention to just overall a lot of uh, potential flooding going on across the region right here and this is just category 1 uh, uh, right here and this is uh, the storm surge area right here where we're seeing possibly gr uh, greater than 6 feet above uh, the uh, above the tide and a lot of these islands and a lot of these areas in the Reese River basins right there that do overflow these banks if the storm surge does approach and everything like that. Because when you see a hurricane, let's say it, let's say it moves off and moves uh, uh, coming from Florida right uh, right there. So what it does as it's approaching there is the winds, at least for a short period of time, will make will push into the into the shore and cause some uh, some coastal flooding and everything like that due to the orientation of the hurricane if it's moving in through Florida. However, as it's approaching uh, this, uh, the Carolinas, and if it starts to make that curve, then you're going to start seeing that tide move away from the coast due to that orientation. Remember, hurricanes flow counterclockwise due to the Coriolis effect. So that's what's go. Uh, what's the main thing right here? But overall, I do see this as a potential, a potentially alarming area, even for a Category One hurricane to organize and develop over here. Let's take a look at Category Three. Yeah. If a major hurricane hits this area in the Carolinas, it's not going to end very well based on storm surge alone. Again, I've uh, again I've been to Charleston, but I've not been to this part of South Carolina before, so I can't really tell you what the infrastructure in that area is looking like. So please let me know down in the comments below, and that way I can, uh, that way it'll help me out and just get, get me more information to kind of broadcast to you guys. So that's what we're looking at right here. Overall, a lot of areas that are, are going to be flooded uh, right here. A lot of areas, like especially in low-lying areas, especially in more the, uh, of the rural and poor communities, could get really flooded out right here. So that's definitely something we need to pay attention to. And overall, this probably looks like the greatest threat for any area in the Carolinas right here that I am paying attention to. Now we're going to go ahead and move on to the Charleston area and kind of see what the threat is looking like right here. Charleston is situated on uh, situated right here on uh, I believe on Charleston Bay near Fort Sumter and those areas right 
uh, right there. So here's what we have. There's Charleston. That's Mount Pl uh, Pleasant. That's Sullivan's Island. That's the Isle of Palms over here right there. I was visiting there about two years ago, kind of looking at the area. It's a very beautiful place to go to, and I really love Charleston. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend you go over the, uh, over the summer when there's not hurricanes in the forecast. But anyway, here's what we have right here. A lot of these areas around Sullivan Island and around the Isle of Palms, like especially uh, especially further inland right here in a lot of these island areas, look like they're going to get flooded pretty easily. Thankfully, there's not that's not going to be as much the case as in, like, as in Sullivan Island or the Isle of Palms. That's primarily due to the fact that there's a bunch of sand dunes, there's a bunch of levees over there. That can help kind of mitigate the flooding. Charleston isn't uh, th as fortunate. It does have a bit of a sea wall, but it only goes up, I think, about four, uh, five, six feet at most. And there's some areas in Charleston that are just on the river uh, right there, uh, just not on the river, but just on the bay. And it's just overall not looking like a very optimal area uh, area to be when it comes to hurricane flooding. If, it, to, if we to, if we look at a major hurricane approaching the area, kind of like how Hugo, Hugo did in, her, in 1989, yeah, the entire area of Charleston is going to get pretty much hammered by that. And that's the kind of flooding that we saw from Hurricane Hugo back in 1989. So that's just some optimal. Uh, that's just something to take a look at right here. Hugo is a cat four when it made la uh, when it made landfall. I believe winds of 140 miles per hour. It was a pretty incredible storm to take a look at right here. Yeah, a lot of this is just not very good for a lot of areas in the Charleston area in particular. But even as a major hurricane, even a Category Two hurricane could cause some major flooding due to a lot of low lying areas right there. And if you're in the Isle of Palms, you're in Sullivan's Island. Yeah, you're definitely going to get flooded if those dunes start to burst or the water comes in from behind and comes in from the north side and goes through all these uh, these areas right here where the water is. So we'll have to pay attention to all of that as we continue to look at it. Moving up further north, we're going to go ahead and move up to the uh, more of the areas of the Carolina coast, more to so uh, more so near the Myrtle Beach area, like pretty much from the from uh, pretty much excuse me from uh, well not Charleston but pretty much uh, from Georgetown to Myrtle's Beach. In that region around there, mainly because I want to take a look at. I, I honestly, Myrtle's uh, Myrtle Beach does not look like they have like they have probably the least amount of threat for storm surge flooding due to two reasons uh, right here. Number one, from what I understand, there's quite a lot of sand dunes in that region that uh, that prevent storm surge flooding, and that's going to help slow it down quite a bit, especially if it's just a Category One, just a Category One, uh, making landfall. Uh, anything other than that, even Category Two, Category Three, it doesn't even push that far, uh, that far inland, right there, which I find kind of interesting. Part of it maybe just because of these the presence of these barrier islands over here that we'll have to take a look at right here. But still, I find it kind of interesting that we're not seeing uh, we're not seeing that much of a uh, inland push. Although it is understandable as well because you're also seeing other areas that could see a lot of storm surge flooding for ex uh, for example around Moore's Corner right here even for a category one a lot of these islands and a lot of this, these areas around the river basin are going to get flooded primarily just due to them being low-lying areas and the orientation of the storm depending on the angle it, that it approaches so we'll have to pay very close attention to that as time continues to go on but Myrtle's Beach I'm not really that concerned about unless you're like right on the coast or anything like that if a hurricane does approach major hurricane yeah that's going to be caused problems no matter what but for Myrtle Beach North Myrtle Beach especially the the threat from there is going to be more of a wind threat once you get up to major hurricane strength than a surge threat just because of the orientation just all of the sand dunes and everything like that that kind of gives it that natural protection right there so that's what we are looking at for here now we're going to move up to the Wilmington area in North Carolina where Hurricane Isaias made landfall also shout out Connor who lives uh, who lives south of Wilmington he's been talking to me about weather over there and we'll hopefully have him back in Storms, uh, Storms United to give us some updates whenever the hurricane season does come pick up right here but this is kind of the situation that we had in North Carolina this is where Hurricane Isaias made landfall uh, generally ar around here and overall when Hurricane Isaias made landfall yeah it did quite cause quite a bit of storm surge flooding but it was mainly pretty bad in a lot of the rivered a areas and everything like that and but a lot of it was also absorbed by the barrier islands over here that are still pretty evident 
right here, but as you get into the Wilmington area, you do start to see that threat of, of river flooding due to that storm surge pushing in to the uh, pushing into the river area. Even a major hurricane, if, let's say that happens, it'll mainly be isolated uh, to the barrier islands and the river basins right here, but Wilmington could definitely get some pr uh, pretty destructive damage, but I would be more concerned about the wind than the storm surge pretty much for this hurricane season. And then my favorite place to be, Topsail, Topsail Island over here in North Carolina. This is kind of like what happened with Hurricane Florence in 2018. You, do, you saw some flooding and you saw the dunes get hammered pretty hard, but overall right there, uh, overall, especially in Surf City, it's been mainly the wind. In fact, when I was over there in 2019, the pier, the famous pier that was there was still under construction due to Hurricane Florence in, 2000, in October, September 2018. Even 10 months later, they were still recovering. But yeah, for, for these areas, especially around the, uh, especially that have the dunes to protect them, it's more of a wind threat at that point. And especially as we continue to move through and as, start, as we start to get into the Outer Banks after, after we pass Emerald Isle over here. But this is the area I'm also pretty concerned about over here in Northeast North Carolina, where there, where the Outer Banks are. Outer Banks, I'm not too concerned, uh, concerned about. I'm unless it's like a major hurricane or something like that approaching there. However, what I am concerned about is inland in North Carolina. There's a lot of rivers and lakes over there that could cause a lot of flooding in a lot of these regions over here. There's a lot of uh, of poor uh, people that live uh, live here in North Carolina that are at risk for flooding right here. So we'll have to pay attention to that. If we see a major hurricane in that region, yeah. Not only is it going to uh, cause a lot of flooding in the river basins, it's also going to put a lot of these areas underwater for, uh, for a short period of time as the storm surge just crashes through and just starts flooding everything over there. So yeah, this and uh, areas south of Charleston in South Carolina is where I'm most concerned about for this hurricane season. Mainly due to the low-lying areas, there's a lot of poor people that live there. There's also a lot of agriculture that grows over over there that we'll have to pay attention to uh, right there. So yeah, it's not looking the most optimal for those two areas. But if you're in areas like if you're in areas like Myrtle Beach into Wilmington and those areas in North Carolina, the main threat's going to be wind this uh, this year, mainly due to the protection of the dunes. And I hope both the states of North Carolina and South Carolina do invest in creating sand dunes to as well as creating levees and barriers to help mitigate storm surge flooding if they have the money to do so. But we'll keep you updated here on the Pat's Path Predictor channel. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. It helps us out, helps us make more videos like these. The goal of this channel, as always, is to get more people engaged with weather. Once again, shout out Connor for talking to me about this. He is from North Carolina, so hopefully we can have him come on here for an interview, have him back in Storms United. I really hope to see him there. With that being said, though, have a wonderful day, guys. Stay safe.